Good evening. Uh, I am Roger Schlick. I'm the Vice President of Sales for Coalesce. I want to welcome you all um, to this really extraordinary event. Um, and thank you for coming. I know that uh, dealing with the weather, dealing with the traffic can sometimes be um, a little adverse. So I appreciate it uh, very much that you were able to do that. I'm going to speak very briefly because I'm going to turn it over to these wonderful people behind me. Um, I have the pleasure um, to introduce to you Connie Duckworth, who is the founder and CEO of Arzu Studio Hope. And I'm just going to say a couple words um, about Connie and, and about what we believe about this partnership that we have with Arzu. Coalesce has several partnerships with uh, several different companies. Um, this, by far and away, is a partnership that allows us to leave an imprint on the world beyond furniture. And it's not often that you get a chance to do that, right? So when I was a little kid, you, or when I ask my own children and I say, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up, right? There's a lot of times nebulous answers about this, that, or and what the application may be. Um, I have a chance, the people who work at Coalesce have a chance today, the people at Arzu Studio Hope have this chance all the time. We have a chance now to make a difference, right? It's not about selling a lounge chair. It's not about selling a uh, ergonomic seat. It's not about selling a table. Um, this is about advancing a cause, um, and a really remarkable cause that it is. And I'm going to let Connie talk about that. Um, and to do that, um, I really appreciate, again, um, the effort that you all made to come. Um, we welcome you. We'll have this conversation. And then you're free to move about the, uh, the sixth, seventh, and eighth floor. Um, we've had a relationship now with Connie for about six or seven months. Uh, conversations going on for um, time before that. Uh, we really wanted to enter into this partnership with them because of what they stand for and what they do. And this is an example of that, of bringing really creative people, um, honorary dignities to us to have a conversation about how they are seeing this relationship with Arzu um, and how it expands upon that. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Connie Duckworth. Thank you very much, Roger. And first of all, I want to thank Bob and Michael and Susan again for agreeing to come tonight, and all of you for making the effort on this rainy day to learn a little bit about Arzu. Um, just a, a brief couple of minutes of background to set the, 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 really the framework for what you're going to hear, which is much more about art and architecture. Um, I'm a finance person by training and background, so I often say I don't have an artistic bone in my body, so I'm really, really honored and excited to be up against people who have way more than one such bone. Um, I started Arzu um, and founded it uh, now 10 years ago after my first trip to Afghanistan in January of 2003. I'm live in Chicago, Chicago-based, and the temperature in Kabul, Afghanistan is much like Chicago in January, and we'd been warned there'd be no heat. I was there with a very small women's delegation because women's rights has always been my passion, especially women's economic empowerment. So the hook for me on that first visit, and we met with Karzai, and we met with the finance ministers and all these people. But the hook for me was on the way back to the airport, we stopped at a really ugly, and even without an architectural bone in my body, I could tell you this was an ugly Soviet cinder block building that had been bombed on top of it. And there were dozens of widows and small children squatting with, for this as shelter, and it was 25 degrees outside. And that, for me, was the seminal moment. I came back and I said, I'm going to do something to find a way to employ women. Now, that's easier said than done. It took about a year to figure out some means to employ them. We backed into rugs as the only viable, culturally acceptable form of employment. We took about a year of research and all of that. We are a organized legally as a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Here we are a local Afghan run and led NGO there, but we operate like a social business, an emphasis on the word social and business. So think of it as sort of a souped up co-op for women. And it took five years to build our base, but after, and that meant 
literally starting with 30 weavers in June of 2004, and we now employ somewhere between four and 500 weavers in the middle of nowhere Afghanistan, Bamiyan province, where the large and glorious Bamiyan Buddhas were destroyed by the Taliban. We work within line of sight of the Buddha niches. So we have several other, hundred other people who work doing various other kinds of jobs for Arzu, including running a whole cadre of social programs. Because this is the deal. We pay, we're a member of the Fair Trade Federation, and we have no child labor. And for those of you familiar with the rug industry, it's not exactly a showcase of um, human rights. So we basically just said, okay, we're disintermediating all, disintermediating all the middle guys, we're paying the women a fair wage, and in exchange for that extra money, their families, meaning male head of household, that could be grandpa, it could be teenage son, has to actually thumbprint a social contract with us. And that contract is you get the money, and in exchange, all kids, girls and boys, get registered in school. And all women in the household are released from under their mother-in-law's nose. They all live with their mother-in-law's for life. Think about that one, ladies. Um, and are released to us two hours a day for literacy classes. So our ladies, which started as 100% illiterate, are now reading uh, their literate and numerate at about a fifth grade level, pretty much the highest adult literacy in the household. Um, they're also the only wage earner. And then the last piece of the social contract is that the family must release the pregnant women to our staff and we have a chaperone known to the community, a four-wheel drive vehicle, and a driver, and we physically pick them up and take them for pre- and postnatal care. Now, this sounds like a small thing. We call it grandiosely our maternal health program because Afghanistan has either the highest or second highest maternal death rate in the world. But since we've been doing this since 2006, and we're really, it's logistics, it's really as simple as that but it's filling a gap, and that's what Arzu is very good at doing. We've not lost a single mother or baby in childbirth since 2006, just by doing logistics. So what Arzu has become and morphed into over the last now nine years, we're entering our ninth year of production, um, is really a learning laboratory for grassroots economic development that can go very deep. We are the drip irrigation to traditional international development practices, which I describe as fire hose funding. Ah, there's a disaster in Haiti. Aim the fire hose and pump out the cash and watch most of it run off. Ah, tsunami, aim the fire hose. That's not what we're about. It's a slow, patient build. We've been at this a long time, and I have to say that I have to give due credit to the gentleman here and their colleagues for most graciously agreeing to design and gift Arzu some absolutely incredible modern patterns, very unlike anything our weavers have seen before. They have, our weavers, I believe, have risen to the challenge. And so when I look at these gentlemen and their patterns, you're looking at the most iconic design in the world being produced by women who are the bottom, the seller of the bottom of the pyramid, living in a country that's been deemed the worst place in the world to be a woman. So this is not about charity product. We're structured as a charity, but remember, social business. So the one thing I hope that you'll walk away from tonight is the only way, the last piece in our puzzle We've gotten it to work on the ground in Afghanistan. We've achieved our most, uh, this is our pinnacle of an artistic achievement with women who, again, couldn't read or write 10 years ago. Um, but now it's really up to the design community, the people in this room, to decide that the product that these women make is worthy of being specified in your projects and then actually following through and specifying it. 
because that is the ultimate key to what I call sustainability in a social business. And I'm going to end there. Thank you very much for making the effort to come. Thanks, Connie, very much. Um, a remarkable lady and a remarkable cause. Um, and we're, again, really happy to be a partner with it. Um, I am going to introduce uh, Susan Sanazi, who is the editor-in-chief of Metropolis Magazine. And she is going to run the show from here. Thank you. Am I plugged in? Can you hear me? OK, hi, everyone. So before we get to the gentleman on my left and right, I'd like to ask Connie a question. I'd like to clarify something. So is there a, is there a mic here that she can grab onto? Yeah. Yeah, because you said something very interesting that I really need clarification on. Because the women do the work, and the money goes to the male heads of household. What is that about? Let me clarify. OK, thank you. The way the rug industry traditionally works is that the woman is not let out of her compound. So the man goes and collects money, or the middleman comes and delivers money, typically to the man. So we work always to be culturally uh, sensitive and acceptable to the community. So we pay 100% of the local weaving rate, which is typically paid still to the man who comes to the office to collect or comes to the home. However, we also pay a 50% quality, we call it quality incentive bonus, and that's paid in a little ceremony into the hands of the woman in front of her entire household. Now, our ladies know how to add, subtract, and multiply. So they know that if they've just been paid X, then their husbands have been paid throughout the course, meaning the family has been paid, 2X. So they know exactly what's going on money-wise, and everyone in the household knows exactly who's earning that money. And what we found over time, because we track these families and um, we, we track the demographics, how the family's uh, life changes over time. And what we've seen is that there's a shift in the balance of power in the household. The women are elevated into a position that is really not common in Afghanistan. They have more say in what goes on. And I'll just say one funny vignette, because when the master weaver who sits at the left side of a row of weavers, to, the number depends on the size of the rug, sort of calling the cadence for the weavers, like a, uh, someone on a, a crew boat. Well, if she gets up for some reason, usually to go fetch something, you know, fetch water, fetch wood, fetch whatever, then the whole process stops. So one of our staff relayed recently that he was in a home, and you know, we're in the homes all the time, and the husband says, oh, no, honey, you stay working, and I'll go fetch. And to that, we go, yes, that's a small victory, but that's the only way they come in Afghanistan. Well, that's very good. Thank you so much, because I, I couldn't let that go. My feminist heart was asking for it. So anyway, I'd like to introduce our panelists very briefly. To my right is Michael Graves who designed two rugs for our zoo. Uh, I hope you got to see some of them out there. They're really beautiful, and I'd like uh, him to talk a little bit about the, the rugs. And then Robert Stern, who designed one rug, so they're competing with each other. They already had a little He's fist ahead. fight. He's ahead, he has two. He's ahead. <laughs> so the two of them had a little tete-a-tete -tete already about this. So I think uh, uh, Robert Stern is going to be designing others, I'm sure. <laughs> And then Michael will be way ahead of him anyway. So uh, I think that's really great. And so Robert Stern is obviously, he has his own practice, architecture and interior practice. But he also designs products, other products, not just rugs. And he's the dean of Yale University School of Architecture. So, so I think uh, you all know this, but I just needed to kind of confirm that. Now, let's talk a little bit about your designs for the rugs, Michael. I mean, they're so beautifully colored. Uh, combinations and shapes and all of that. Can you think about, can you talk about what you were thinking about when you were designing those rugs? Sure. Um, there are three seats for anybody standing back there that Up here. wants to sit down. 
Maybe you like to stand so you can get out and if this is boring. <laughs> um, we, I've been working uh, for the past 10 years or so on a group of, of designs which are always meant for wall hangings or rugs, uh, starting with some buildings of ours. Uh, and I've used uh, arabesques uh, to suggest these figures that are in one way or another um, uh, floating within this field. I do that because uh, it's important for me to, if it is a rug, if we walk in and into the room from that side and this is front, or that side and this is front, or the ends, uh, it's important not to have, uh, for me, a horizon line, uh, a, a top, a bottom, or a side, but to give equity to the whole thing. So this is what I tried to do uh, within that color field that you saw. Yeah, I think you all need to look at it because they, they are really beautiful. And, and Bob Stern's uh, rug is very Bob Stern. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> well, it's, it's sort of decorative and geometric and very subdued and very sort of uh, very elegant. Not that Michael's isn't. I got, you know, I'm very now in the middle of all of this. Uh, so uh, can you talk about a little bit about your, what you were thinking about? Well, th this design comes from... Uh, We've generated a lot of designs for fabrics over the last, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years. They all don't get used. And besides that, when you make a design and then it's woven according to one mill or another mill, and I'm sure there are plenty of people in this room who know about this, it comes out rather different and you have to work with the mill and, and so forth. Since we are not weavers uh, by, by training, we are designers. So, um, uh, uh, and lots of time, uh, and, and the themes we've been using to inspire us in designing for these fabrics have often been architectural themes, um, um, wrought iron or uh, of iron work in architecture, decorative iron work, which happens to be the inspiration for the rug that's out in the uh, showroom. Uh, it's a kind of 19th century, late 19th century kind of idea of uh, iron work, kind of thing you would have found in a McKim Mead and White uh, screen or something like that in a house and that's the source of it. And it really had been generated for fabrics, but didn't get used, so there it was. No, no, no good idea should ever not given a second chance. Great, great. So knocking yourself off a little bit there. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I'm a jerk. I'm knocking anybody off, actually. <laughs> okay, he so needs that. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about the craft because I think those rugs are beautifully made and they require a really uh, um, real understanding of the craft of rug making. And uh, I remember when both of you were part of that generation, we date way back, way back, more than this room has ever experienced. So uh, I remember there was a lot of talk in architecture about not having any uh, important and interesting and qualified craftspeople around. And uh, that has turned around in a very big way in the past many years. And I think, you know, Michael's interiors have really amazingly made things, and so does the Stern interiors. So uh, can, you, can we talk a little bit about your relationship to craft now as it exists? Uh, Michael, maybe uh, you can kind of address that. Well, I know that whatever I try, I want to have a fair chance of success. So that I don't try, whether it's in, uh, generally, it's not craft that gives me fits, but the expression of technology. Uh, and that just never works for me and, and uh, in any kind of metaphorical sense. Uh, so I, I try to work with, with uh, crafts as we know them and, and sometimes you have to teach the craftsman what he or she can do. For instance, back in the uh, 60s and 70s, I was, I was showing the craftsman how to soak 
wallboard overnight so that you could bend it into the shape uh, on the wall that you wanted. If there were a curve in the wall, they didn't know how to, how to do that. It's not a very difficult process as long as you're patient and, and, and soak it overnight and do that. But I remember that as being a little breakthrough and, and so uh, we were, we were uh, experimenting with that material that, that our clients could afford now, if I were an, another architect who had a different client and who perhaps part of the elite, uh, meaning they could afford it, they would have made that curved wall out of plaster. But we didn't have that. So we had to find ways of dealing with these questions of economy. So, your, well, your training was a modernist training, and so you weren't taught any of that in architecture school, were you, or were you? Certainly not. So you, you came to all of that on your own in, in trying to achieve the effects that you were trying to right. achieve. Right. Yeah. You, you learned very quickly that there's a lot that you didn't get taught in college. <laughs> uh, in fact, Bob and I went to school at a time which was primarily ahistorical. There was, we had one history course uh, on Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. You can imagine how many people showed up for that. <laughs> I taught, had a slightly better education. Taught by a retired architect. <laughs> um, but um, I, had, I had other architects, or other historians, some of them you would know, uh, who taught history at, at Harvard, but it was such a biased affair that, that uh, you ended up not knowing who Palladio was, and that was that was, it was just tragic what we all went through. So, but but craft was the same thing. So all of that was self-taught for both of you then, as yeah. as you practiced. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. But craft is a. I would take the craft question in a slightly different direction. First of all, when when Michael and I were beginning architects, people said there were no craftsmen. And, and in probably, let's say in New York or in the, in the Northeast, they were probably right, except there were craftsmen who were working for decorators. But other than that, there were no craftsmen working in architecture because architects didn't want craft. Or, or, and the people who were studying crafts as, as a discipline all were thinking they were artists. So they were making things to hang on walls. They, were, they knew wonderful techniques, but they weren't interested in doing my design. They wanted to do their design, which is fine. But we have benefited in this country, especially in the New York area, I think, since the 80s, since the wall came down, of a tremendous number of people who are really skilled, who were trained in the, in the so-called Eastern Bloc. And they've come here. And there's a wealth of craftsmen, craftspeople, I should say, available who really know how to build beautiful things. And all they're writing for for people to tell them what to do. I don't know if it's going to have another generation, because I'm not sure. They, I, I'm pretty sure the kids of these craftsmen um, are all going to um, business school. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, while they're around, we still have them. And, and, um, uh, and it, it's a wonderful resource. And there's not a day goes by that our office isn't solicited by some wonderful woodworker or weaver or mural painter or uh, eglomise, if I'm saying it correctly, you know, painting on glass and all these things. First of all, I never heard of those things when I went to architecture school. All we knew about was hacking away at concrete. Uh, uh, and, um, but they, they're here now, and so we should take advantage of them. It's, and they can do fresh new things, um, because, but they have skills. And, and, and I learned a lot from them. Well, some of the most interesting things that are happening right now in making things, the makers, as they're called, they're, many of them are architects, trained as architects, who are just like you, are reinventing, the, you reinvented you know, modern architecture into this sort of, I hate to use the word, no, postmodern. No, 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 word. no, no, I don't want to use the word, but I did. But, but I mean, you're a more, a kind of more, more forgiving, humanistic, more sort of, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, historically related uh, um, architecture. But I think right now there, there's this generation that really gets technology and really wants to make things. And it's not all extruded and it's, there's a lot of craft that goes in there. So it's a different attitude toward craft. But it is happening in a very interesting way. So I just wanted to say that I'm not worried about the next generation of craftspeople, but they are doing things differently. But Bob's being very generous because um, the, um, there are architects working today. If you mentioned craft to them, they would spell it a different way. And they're just, um, I mean, can you imagine if you introduced a woodworker to Rem Kuhlhaus? Uh, you know, what, what is, what kind of blind date is this? And, uh, you know, this, this is, this is a date search. I mean, you, it's not gonna work. And I could go down the list of 20 or 30 architects like that that would have no use for a craftsman. Bob Wood, uh, and there are a whole group of young architects, for instance, at the University of Miami in, in uh, Coral Gables, who would love to meet craftsmen because their work will accept it so readily, uh, their domestic work especially. But it takes a special kind of architect, one who wants to make something in, and unify it with, with a craftsman. To, to get the best results. So uh, we talked a little bit about before this about what you're both working on and I'd like to start with Bob uh, because it's really interesting that you do a lot of campus work now and you're sort of competing. I mean, you're doing campus work at Yale too and others, uh, you're, you're in charge of the, the kind of look and feel of the university and you really are very much involved with the university. In fact, everybody's always singing your praises about how much you helped <laughs> develop the campus. And then you're working on campus work all over the country. So can you talk a little bit about that work and uh, what that, why you feel it's so important that somebody like you with a contextual mind is involved in all of this? Well, um, there are many um, people come to us as architects because we are contextually minded and these great campuses all over the country which architects designed and uh, people paid for all through the late 19th and early 20th century and there are others that even preceded are uh, suddenly besieged by uh, architects of Michael's and my generation and a bit younger who come onto the campus and say, oh, that's all very nice, but this is what we really need to do. And we have facilities people at these colleges who somehow think that they are art curators and not simply <laughs> facilities people, you know? And they have to catch up. <laughs> they have to be ahead. They compete with each other. They meet in something called SCUP. What a revolting name. <laughs> um, <laughs> and talk about it, you know, being ahead. Anyhow, there are still some campuses, still some administrators of campuses, and still some trustees who value what went before and would like to see it adapted and move forward with new buildings in a sympathetic way. So they call me up, and that's good. I'm ready to serve. <laughs> um, let, me, let me go on with that because we've been the campus architects for Rice University for I think the last 15 years. Well, we aren't anymore. James Terrell built a, a thing uh, on, on the campus and I went in it and, and I said to myself, and then what? Um, but it was a roof with a hole, a donut in the center, and it came down almost to the ground, and then it had a seat around it, and I'm sure you're supposed to do zen or contemplation or something in it, but it's in a very awkward place for that to take, take hold in, on the campus. But I said to people in my office, watch out, because there's somebody on this campus that wants to destroy the Ralph Adams cram plan of the 20s and do this kind of thing to, as when I said catch up, and Bob said go ahead, 
to do the new, whatever the new is. So in, in, we got the call finally, and they said, we're, um, we're so sorry that this has happened, but there's a movement among the trustees um, who are, in that case, the, uh, the, the, the campus overseers, the physical overseers of the campus, and um, they want to go in a new direction. This campus is so glorious. Bob's built there, I've built there. It is such a pretty place. And it's such a nice place to go to school. And now they're going to get the other. <laughs> they're going to get something else to keep up with the Joneses. Uh, so even Ralph Adams Graham can't keep the lid on, nor could we, but we tried. Okay, so, so Bob, you mentioned that some of the, much of the work, campus work is business schools, science schools. Uh, obviously, there's more funding for business than anything else, and obviously science research, there's a lot more uh, funding for that. Are they, uh, are they progressive about architecture, or are they, uh, uh, what, what is the attitude of these schools toward architecture? Well, it varies, but I don't, um, I don't think architecture and progressiveness have anything to do with each other. If architecture were progressive, then we would have beaten the Parthenon years ago, but we still haven't done that. So I don't think art progresses, I think art evolves. Um, but I think that it's, it varies on the campus. It varies who's in, you know. Uh, it's like when Michael and I worked for the Disney Company. Michael Eisner, who was the head of the Disney Company, was interested in architecture, he is still interested in architecture. But he always said it's not a company policy, it has to do with who's in charge. Like IBM years ago in the 50s and 60s, the Watsons were truly interested in architecture. So that's what changes it. But the business schools do have money now. I don't know what all these people are gonna do. Um, the lawyers are all out of work, which is probably a blessing. Um, <laughs> but but um, the business, all these kids, I mean, it's a discipline, of course. But it, uh, it's uh, undergraduate business education, don't get me too started on the topic. They don't do much humanities reading. I was always of the opinion that you read the great classics and they teach you how to think and you analyze them and so forth, and that prepares you for, for your, your life's work, whatever it might be. Uh, that is a debate that goes on in campuses. But in any case, we, we're working at, we've worked at Harvard, um, uh, um, Norman Foster's doing the new business school at Yale. It's not contextual. Uh, you'll see it. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, it's going to open in January. Uh, we've worked at um, uh, many campuses across the country, including Rice, where we did the business school when it moved for, to a bigger, newer building. Uh, and right, the Rice campus is, as Michael says, a beautiful campus, and that Terrell piece is completely ridiculous. And there's also a other very elegant pavilion stuck in the middle of the campus. Yes, all glass. All glass. In, On a brick in Houston, campus. which has such a delicious climate. <laughs> so uh, there's another area of activity which is uh, high level for you, Michael, healthcare. And uh, uh, I mean, there, there are obvious reasons why you're involved in healthcare now, but I think it's really also very important for us to, let's talk about specifically the patient room that you you yeah. are you are so incredibly articulate about talking about this because it is it is the worst room in the hospital i was talking to susan before this started and i said the equation has been inverted where the money goes into the new atrium where nobody convalesces because it's usually facing the highway um, and not the patient room. Well, to go further, when I was in eight hospitals, four rehab centers, I, I was complaining all the way and that it was this close to third world. And I thought, what can I do? I'm a designer, I'm an architect, but I'm a patient as well. And I ought to be able to do something. A very short story. I was in rehabilitation and my uh, therapist said to me, Michael, you know, if you are able to put on your own clothes and get into your wheelchair without help, 
and roll yourself into the bathroom and brush your teeth and shave and comb your hair and all, you can get out of this place. You're just about ready to go home, but you've got to prove to me that you can do that. So I stacked up all my clothes dutifully the, night, the next night and with underwear on the top so I could go backwards and get everything on. And it took about an hour for me, as it would today, to get all my clothes on and tie my shoes and so on. She had told me that if I used Velcro on my shoes that it'd go much faster. I told her they were too ugly, I couldn't do that. But <laughs> anyway, I, I was feeling, I got, I got dressed. I used a sliding board for getting into the chair to make the transfer from the bed to the chair. I was very happy about that. Uh, and spun myself around, feeling very self-empowered, and rolled into the bathroom and looked up on the wall, and the mirror, the bottom of the mirror started here and went up. Clearly it was for somebody standing. This was a rehab hospital where all patients are in wheelchairs. You're either a quadriplegic or a paraplegic, but you're in a wheelchair. So uh, I had asked my, my surgeon before that, I had said, who designed this? And he said, experts. <laughs> and, and I knew who he was talking about. Uh, probably a three letter from, from Texas who does healthcare and they're all experts. But from, from that I said, well, at least I could brush my teeth and I couldn't reach the faucet. And then I, same thing for shaving, I couldn't reach the faucet. I thought, well, I can, I can call my office tomorrow morning and, and have them bring down a, an electric razor. Ah, but where will I plug it? And I looked around and the plug was on the floor. Well, it was on the wall adjacent to the floor. And so that, I couldn't reach that either. My, my doctor came in just at that moment I told him I wanted to play a little game with him. It was, while he did his rounds, this was, I had the rounds this morning. He didn't, he couldn't tell me what to do. I had to tell him. And he asked me what I wanted and I said, go out in the hall and get a wheelchair and, and sit in it and come in here and go take yourself into the bathroom. How does your hair look this morning? <laughs> and now you are me, not you, because I can only bend from here up. I can't bend from here. Uh, and I said, turn on the faucet for brushing your teeth. I can't reach the faucet. Same thing. He backed himself out and he said, what are you trying to say? I'm saying you don't have experts and you're doing a $30 million addition to this institution. Are the same people doing it? He said, yes, they were. I said, you don't learn too quickly, do you? And I was getting pissed off, really, with all this money being spent on this kind of facility. And I said, you're going to have to do one of two things. Teach yourself how to read plans or get your brother-in-law or somebody who's an architect to read plans for you because your architects aren't doing it for you. Or build a model room like they do in, in hotel design. And then you'll know that the mirror is for somebody standing. Uh, he promised he would, of course he didn't. And they have more of the same. So I can't recommend it to anybody. So, I mean, I, I understand that, that this is a, uh, this seems to be so obvious that I don't understand why it's not even considered. So tell me in your honest assessment, since you are on the other side and you're experiencing all of this, where is the missing link here? I mean, the where did you ever think that architects were smart? Well, you guys are smart. No, no, no. I no, mean, there, there are, aren't they very are many smart. smart architects. No, they just want a photograph and go home. Well, then I think uh, they deserve to be irrelevant as they think that they are becoming. Well, I'm trying to do that. Because I really think everybody's worried of, I mean, that's all I hear from architecture offices, that they're, they're being irrelevant. Well, if they do the patient room like you just described it, they need to be irrelevant. I was asked, I've got a new hospital to do in, 
in Omaha, and the client, who's a wonderful woman, said to me, is there a good hospital I can go look at? Do you all know one? A really good hospital? And I remembered one from, from, from looking at Alto, of people sitting out on, in, in steamer chairs on the balcony, looking at the forest beyond and thinking that might have been a good rehabilitation hospital. I don't know. But it, it's, it's a dreadful, dreadful situation we're in right now. So um, we're also transplanting all this bad knowledge and bad architecture all over the world. I mean, uh, ar American architects are building the Middle East, Asia, enormous projects. It, is, it tends to be at least 45% of their work, which is like 95% of their income probably, uh, because there is, there, there is more money everywhere else than there is here at the moment. So you both work in, in China, in other places. So uh, Bob, can you talk about your experiences there? What are you transplanting to China? From the US. Well, it's a very interesting question uh, that I hope is on the minds of architects, but I tend to agree with Michael. That it's not a profession given to profound thinking, let's put it that way. But people are hired to bring Western ideas to non-Western countries. Just like in the 19th century, people, say Newport, Rhode Island, where they would bring over French architects or whatever, or, they, or American architects were told to go there and learn. And, because it's a way the transportation of ideas is very important. That's what global exchange is about. It goes back to the dawn of time. The Romans did it, and Marco Polo, and whatever. So I think we are going to China to share our expertise. And we do have expertise. I don't mean me or my partnership. I just mean Americans. Um, but we are building buildings there that don't particularly say anything about China. It could be built anywhere. And of course, now we have China envy here in New York City. Mayor Bloomberg would like Midtown to look like Shanghai. In Shanghai, they finally come to the senses and realize Shanghai is getting to be, look like Midtown, and they, don't, and they don't want it that so much anymore. So that, that's another irony. Another irony is we're doing a project, a small project, but very important uh, for uh, Stephen Schwarzman, the investor. He is setting up something like the Rhodes Foundation. Um, and he's given $100 million of his own money, and um, I've gotten $100 million from somebody, some other people who are beholden to him, and he'll find the three, last $100 million to do that. And we're doing the building. And Schwarzman's idea, and I go along with it completely, he said, you know, you go to China, you can't find any Chinese architecture anymore. You have no idea, um, except like in restaurants and and uh, Amman resorts have high-end evocations of traditional Chinese architecture. So we're making a building that is in the traditional Chinese mode. It's a totally modern building. Students from all around the world will live in it. Faculty from around the world will also live there and so forth. But the flavor of the building will reflect traditional Chinese architecture. Uh, our, all around it, our buildings were built under the influence of the Soviets, basically which are horrendous, horrendous, and no place buildings. Um, so uh, this balance of cultural transmigration and, um, and, and expertise migration, if you will, is very complicated. But I don't, I don't think, I mean, I, I'm enjoying working in China, um, especially since my partners go there. Um, but uh, it's a very exhausting trip. But. Um, uh, 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 but I, but I, I think that when I go there, I'm, I'm very disappointed to see so much um, just bad building. And I, don't, wouldn't, I wouldn't blame us Americans or the other Westerners. I think it's also built into the, the structure of Chinese government, the way they're administering it. So it's, it, you're hitting a, I could talk for hours about it and probably not make a hell of a lot of sense by the end of the conversation. But anybody who works in China owes it to him or herself to be to ask questions of what is the appropriate thing on this particular building, on this particular site, and not just to sort of transplant something from Houston to uh, Beijing. 
So, Michael, what's your favorite country to work in outside of the U.S.? Rome. Rome? <laughs> That's the country itself. That's the country. Yeah. And uh, do you do you do uh, work there? Do you uh, do you build in Rome? I I did a an office building there, which was quite extensive, and didn't get built, which happens to all of us. Uh, and I did a little library, which did get built, but. No, I, I can't say that I built very much in Rome. But I want to tell a, a very short Chinese story. I was asked, along with some other architects, mostly American, uh, to compete for the new AT, AT and T building uh, in China. It's not called AT and T, whatever it's called. And I made my presentation and. The um, lead architect from Skin Warnings and Marrow came up to me afterwards and he said, that's what we wanted to do. What you did is what we wanted to do, but we knew that wouldn't win. And he showed his glass cube, you know, and it won. And to say that you're building out of the Chinese away from the Chinese heritage. The Chinese want to be us, and they want glass. And if they hire Bob, they're not going to get glass like that. They're going to get windows. And, <laughs> and they're going to love it, because they're just not used to it. Because nobody they will changing. do that. They are changing. Yeah. yeah. Evolving. So what was your scheme? What, what did you present? I presented a, a building that was a tall building that had windows, that had articulation, it had places to get out, had places to have lunch at the top, had spas and all. It was a huge building. And so it had, it had sort of rest stops all the way up, which I could make something out of and, in my language and, and so on. And I, I guess I tell you that story because I really loved the building. It really should have gotten built. Whether anybody over here ever sees it or not is another story. But, but that doesn't. That's that's another is another story. Well, just like uh, Bob, you can recycle the building and knock yourself off. It, it, it's harder to recycle a building than it is the uh, a drawing for an unmade oh, fabric. Yes. <laughs> So uh, I, I think that there must be some questions out there in, the, in that wonderful world of yours. Uh, could, would you like to ask some questions? Someone of these? Someone, does someone have a mic who's going to run up and down? There is, a, there is a handheld mic somewhere. There's a question up here. I can we'll repeat, repeat it. Your we'll repeat it. Go ahead. Uh, I want to applaud Mike comments of the hospitals. And if I can give a comment and then a question. <clears throat> so I want to applaud Michael uh, for his comments on the hospital design. And I want to say that my sense is that architects, the average architect today, rather than first analyzing the need and then put some design to address the need, he actually do a quick look on the site and then go and implement what he dreamt of before he understood what the need is. And that's why we see mirrors not in the, in the right height or whatever other comments you have. But I want to ask the two of you another question. You know, historically, when I was young, uh, people were walking and looking around and seeing buildings and appreciate having discussion. Today, if you walk in campuses, or even if you walk in the New York streets, for example, everybody look on this. Nobody looks any longer on buildings. So I want, and we don't talk any longer to each other, we do Facebook. So I want to ask the two of you, to what degree you see the impact of this new information technology that actually prevent us from looking around, prevent us from talking to each other, impacting our appreciation of architecture. <coughs> I was in the Chicago airport the other day, and we were late for our flight, and making a transfer because the flight coming in was late. And I was trying to get from one end to the other, and it was very busy that day. And 90% of the people were on their cell phones and moseying along, da -da, da -da, 
Yes, I did the dishes. No, no, no. <laughs> Telling them they're made really important stuff, you know. And as I passed each one, I looked at them and I said, you're a menace. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of them heard me because they just kept blabbing on. But uh, I agree. I, I mean, just coming here tonight where it was raining, people had their umbrellas, they were wrestling with their umbrellas, and half the people were on their fucking cell phones. <laughs> what is that about? Okay, so Bob, you're... I agree with Michael. No, no, oh, but... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a thousand percent. But, but, but They're let's... They're all crazy. But let's hear from uh, your experience on campus, because you are on campus, you see, you see what the new generation is doing. Of course, Yale is such a rarefied place. I mean, it, you know, everybody's smarter and richer and better. And Not richer. <laughs> smarter. So, well, people love the campus at Yale. They love the campus at Harvard. They love it at Dartmouth. They love it yeah. in lots of places right, that right, are truly right. lovable. So do they, do they show that love for the campus that they're actually looking around, or are they all walking around texting, too? Well, I mean, you know, some people are texting, but they think they enjoy being on the campus, and they, they understand it, and they appreciate it. Princeton used to be a beautiful campus. It's uh, been infiltrated um, with alien growths. Um, but uh, 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 I think they do. But, but I agree with Michael that all this electronic stuff you know, people don't even go to, the, they, they think they're watching a movie when they watch it on, well, I, I don't know, they people, you, it. all of you are probably have one of these watching a movie on this. I, I, I have a smartphone from about 1996 or something, <laughs> and I don't have, an, I don't know how to use a computer, and I don't want to learn. I mean, it just seems to me it takes you away from direct experience, and I think that's what's important, and that's why the question was a the, the, very the question good question. The question is getting worse. I was just at Google where they showed me a TV oh, that oh, goes I've right here. I've worn right. one of those. Yeah. And it's not that, I mean, you just be walking along uh, <laughs> looking at the TV, and that's worse than just the, the cell phone. I mean, is this going to go on? It, well, I don't it's know. a nightmare. It was well, nicer when our phones weighed something and you wouldn't carry them around. <laughs> <laughs> But I have to say, I had a class visiting me from an interior design school last this week, and uh, mostly young women, and they were all saying that they don't, they really don't do the cell phone thing, and they didn't have cell phones with them. Uh, usually, when classes come, half of them are on their smartphones. But this group was very, very much involved in the physical environment. They, they talked about the city. They talked about what they were seeing. So these rays of hope do occur. And I think, and I think they're able to put the technology into its place, which I think we all have to learn. So any other questions in the audience? Brad, you're very quiet. There's one back there. <laughs> there's one back there? Oh, no. No? She's scratching her nose. There's, there's one over there. It's right here. How important is the computer in both of your practices? The computer in your practices? Essential. For everyone But else. it's not a design tool. Yeah. End of story. Yeah. Yeah. We don't design on the computer. We draw. And, and we use the computer for working drawings and all the construction drawings. You, you'd be lost without it. You couldn't get a job without it. It's, it's, it's almost law now that you use a computer, but and it's, and sp specific programs on the computer. But I couldn't, for the life of me, design something on the computer. I wouldn't know how to do that. Regrettably, we have to train people who are coming out of schools, very good people out of very good schools, including the Yale School of Architecture. On they know how to draw. Yale students, but they are so enamored of the computer that they forget that you, the beginning of a design assignment is drawing. But all people who work on computers have lost one fundamental thing, how somebody said scale. How big is anything? They have no idea. A brick is, how many pixels is a brick, you know? I mean, it's crazy. 
So the person who asked the question about people not looking is also the person that, in the old days, that architects were trained. One of the basic design problems was to go out in a flight of stairs. I used to see them in Columbia um, measuring the flights of stairs up to the library. How high is the riser? How deep is the tread? All those kinds of things. Architects would have, there was a comb that you could use to tra trace moldings. And I'm just like, these tools exist, but nobody uses them in schools anymore. So architecture offices, the good ones, have to train people uh, on the site. They know how to do all the com computing stuff, but they don't know how to really design anything. And that's really the problem. And most of the buildings that are being built today regrettably look like they were designed on the computer. So you, as dean of Yale Architecture, you should have a huge influence on reintegrating some of these ideas. Well, we, took, <laughs> we do our best. And we do have lots of uh, uh, hand drawing still as part of the curriculum. And, and, um, and we've even been endowed to have it in perpetuity, which is great. But the Yale Architecture School graduates 65 people a year. I admitted we were all going to run the prof They're all, all going to lead the, the world, of course, but 65 people right. cannot. Too small. Too small. Right. One last question back there, yes? Uh, Christopher Alexander, in his latest book, said that any prefabricated uh, material, such as bricks, compromises contextualization. So my question is, is there a point that contextualization goes too far? There's too much context where every single little thing is individual. I can't believe you said that about a brick. I don't believe that either. I don't think he, he said, said a lot of weird things, but that's but I don't think pushing it. I, I, I don't know how to answer that. So. <laughs> you, you got me. I mean, Bob was talking about the brick, and he was talking about pixels, and, and, and I, whenever I think of bricks, I either think of Lou Kahn, who was, used to have conversations with bricks, um, or, or Leo Creer, who would say, you know, if you use a stone that's this big or a brick that's this big, and you put it into place, one man carrying it to the site, putting it in place, lathering on the, on the mortar and, and doing that and building the wall, it helps understanding the size of that wall because that one man couldn't carry 50 bricks. He can only carry, uh, the hod carrier as he's called, carries about 20 bricks, but he gives the, the mason one brick at a time. And that is a, a kind of scale giveaway for the brick wall, that the bricks didn't come this big so that you couldn't lift them. But our machines can lift them. And that's how you, I mean, you can look across the street as we were before, Bob and I were having a little interview before, and I was looking at the size of the stones. And they, they were 10 feet wide, four feet high. There's no way a man could do that. Therefore, that building for me starts to look machine made, it, only because it was. I think that's my building. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... Uh, Time Warner. <laughs> Time Warner doesn't have any stones. It's it? Scofidio. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, can we go home? Okay. <laughs> I think you did very well. Thank you. Thank you.